Good morning, everybody. I'm Peter down here at the bottom of the world or the top, sometimes <laughs> we call it, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and um, before I begin the Semitic attunement, I'd like to honor the path that your ancestors have walked to this very point in time. That uh, I see the land they've walked on and the water they've drunk and the air they have breathed and the sun they've walked beneath. And I honor those places around you, which are the water and the land and the trees and all of the environment that sustains you. Um, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I honor the Maori people who have come before me to this land and who dwelled here for so long in harmony in many ways with the environment. And I acknowledge all of those elements that are here, the Huatoki River, the mountain Taranaki. And my mountain, as I say, uh, sometimes is Stonehenge. I was born in England. And so I honor those places where I was born. Hmm. So I invite you to take a centering breath. It might start with breathing all of the air out of your lungs. And just notice the way in which your lungs inflate, your belly may move. Just notice how your body responds to this breath of centering. And we're going to hold uh, some sights together. The first sights are actually in the back of the head. Um, I best introduce the esteemed gentleman uh, who shows us some of the meridians, uh, mostly pre uh, postnatal meridians that move in the body. And the sights that we're going to hold are called site number four, which is just behind the back of the head. Uh, just across from the ears is um, Along the occipital ridge, if you follow the ridge along, there's a, a lump in the middle at the top and you want to bring your hands down a little bit outwards. So there's a left and a right four, which you can hold um, with one hand across the back of your head. And notice uh, what it's like if you bring your attention to the surface of your hand. You really bring your the focus of your being uh, even more further than your mind the focus of your senses and your sensory experience to the surface of your hand where it touches the sites number four um, the left and right And if you're using two hands, see what you can do to bring uh, one hand to cut both of those sites. And our other hand is going to go just below the sternum. So um, basically on the four teams, if you lay a hand across this area of your body, which is uh, above your belly button, but below your sternum, And this time, bring your sensory awareness, not to your hand, but to where your hand touches your belly. Notice how your hand moves if you breathe. Pay attention to what you notice more globally in your body. What other things are becoming apparent to you through sensation, 
or a feeling or even the lack of sensation or feeling. Just notice what is without any need to change it. We're really inviting in a meeting with ourself on a more tuned in level. Really get curious. Can even be playful. As if you're meeting a new friend. And what we're going to do next is ask this, this friend, this, this full of sensory experience that we're having, this interaction more deeply with ourselves. Ask yourself, where else does your body want to be held? And take your hand off the back of your head and tune into your own innate intelligence about where your other hand could now go. Let it find a site on your body to hold. Doesn't even need a number. Just follow that intelligence until you arrive on the site that wants to be held. In this conversation with yourself, this relationship with yourself, just notice what's there. Once again, without any need to change or alter or push it in any direction, just tune into what is. Lastly, when you're ready, we'll bring our hands into palm injury. And this can be held anywhere, but you could try holding it at your heart level. Down here in front of your chest. And slowly bring in your senses, what you can hear. what you can taste and smell. Your sense of touch. And lastly, your sense of sight. And you can use your sight to stare into the camera for a little bit and say hello with your eyes to the other people. Good morning. Thank you, Peter. It's a little after six there in Aotearoa in the morning. Uh, and Gerald is joining us from Australia where it's two hours earlier. Uh, so devotion from these gentlemen. Thank you. To give you a sense of our overview uh, for these two days. First of all, just to be sure you're on the right plane, this course is gateways to the impossible that focuses on addressing chronic obstetric 
obstetrics, uh, or perseverating, or stubborn, or repetitive patterns that don't resolve easily. And we are facing that course description with insufficient time to cover it. So I want to announce at the onset here that uh, Peter and I have been talking about a follow through to this course uh, and those details will emerge, but being aware of the magnitude of what I have to share, uh, consider this an introduction to the topic, but a substantial introduction, but there will be an opportunity to add on to this process. So bear that in mind and feel free also to give me your suggestions about what you would like to see in such a follow-on. I had inquired prior to the course for people to let me know what particular chronic conditions uh, you wanted to address. And I didn't hear back from anyone. That will unfold while we're together. We'll get that opportunity. Uh, but those specifics you could uh, bear in mind uh, during the times that we'll make available for questions. And also you can bring those questions to the Mighty Network channel. That's one of the beauties. It adds value to have the Mighty Network channel. So be sure to join if you have not already, because I will answer those questions. I am responsive to what you post in the Mighty Network channel. So it's a way to add time and responsiveness uh, to your curiosity. So, Gateways to the impossible. That phrase defines where we are in the world right now. The entire world is suffering from the consequences of chronic conditions. I believe that will be obvious to all of you. We are paying a price for chronic conditions to which we have all contributed. Now, I'm currently in a different location that I normally teach from. Uh, I'm in my third evacuation from our organic farm in uh, rural Oregon. Uh, first time was fire, second time was ice, third time is drought. Oh, wow. So uh, we literally have to dig a new well, deeper, deeper than 35 feet into the earth because of the drought conditions in the West, the drought that we have created, COVID itself, is the product of these chronic conditions. The trajectory of the Tara approach, which is needless to say a trauma informed paradigm. Uh, it feels almost repetitious to say that since it was developed by a trauma survivor for the very purpose of resolving shock and trauma and what uh, the magnificent Dr. Gabor Mate, my, my favorite trauma guru calls for the first time I heard this term, uh, shock trauma. So he referred to two distinctive categories, shock trauma and trauma. This is after years of me trying to make that distinction and being told that that was an error to even make that distinction. So very validating for me to hear Dr. Mate, who I hope will write the forward to the book I'm working on right now. So this is a trauma-informed approach to addressing chronic conditions. And what does that mean from the Tara approach perspective? 
first of all, in terms of this class, it means finding the empathy and compassion to look at chronic conditions by acknowledging our own. This, of course, is modeled again by Dr. Mate, who of all the trauma gurus, I would say, has the daring to be vulnerable enough to talk about his own trauma history in relationship to his theories. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is the pathway of the wounded healer, the most important pathway. We are all wounded healers. There are no exceptions, but not everyone has identified it. And many people are still living in the armoring that they've created, thereby making the whole process take longer. So that is a major trajectory, particularly today, is for us to be able to identify our chronic conditions and work through that to a true personalized understanding of what chronic conditions are. And simultaneously, not being daunted or overly preoccupied with the chronic condition so that we don't see the person. Essential Tara approach characteristic, attunement to the individual, you're treating an individual, not a diagnosis. And the Tara approach is about the comprehensive history in the body of each person that we serve. So, the focus is not on the chronic condition. The focus is on the person and how the chronic condition, conditions almost always for certain, are the report, the somatic report of that individual about their life. Maybe the parts of their life that are below the radar, in shadow, in secret, hidden, avoided or simply not yet identified, how does the chronic condition elucidate to that person who you have the privilege of serving, including yourself, about that person's life and what is really calling to be seen through that message? So that's an overview of where we're headed with the comprehensive history, um, the assessment criteria, and then probably the um, piece de la resistance. Lydia will say it much better than I. Um, we have two important flows that have never been released before in your handbook, which you will find on the Mighty Networks channel. And a new way of releasing sites that I have never taught in this format before. And both of those flows and the new way of palpating are perfectly matched to chronic conditions under specific circumstances. So that's the most comprehensive overview of the course that I can give in a limited amount of time. This is where we're headed. And of course, all of it will benefit from follow through, but we'll get to all of it uh, to some extent. And Siv or anyone who, for whom English is not your native tongue, please do not hesitate Siv or anyone else here, Liddy, anyone who uh, their original language is not English, uh, because I know that my English can be difficult even for English speakers, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Please don't be shy, Siv. If you have a question, just put it in the chat. Peter's gonna feel the chat for me because I'm likely to miss it, but we'll get it. And you can also do that in the Mighty Networks channel, the questions that you have. I will, it is my pleasure, my joy to explain everything. So when you ask a question, it gives me a chance to go deeper into what it is I'm trying to say. So please don't hesitate. Don't think you're burdening me by asking questions. Okay. Uh, so now what we want to do is meet up in a more personalized way. 
and Peter is going to do the timekeeping on this. Uh, so we're going to introduce ourselves in the moment. Some of you know one another, others are here in this format for the first time. But as I said, Sue Keneally, oh my God, we go way back, go way back. Um, so happy to see you, Sue. So Peter, you want to uh, explain the introductions? Yeah, so uh, have a look in the chat. So there is uh, some instructions there in the chat. Um, we're going to have two minutes each. There'll be a timer. When the timer goes off uh, just before two minutes, then that's your time's up. And um, we would love to hear extensively about you all and have the time to catch up. But there's the course material balance as well. So in that two minutes, share your name, where you're from, and where you are now, if you want. And you can use words, movement, sound, song, to share your understanding, your sense of resilience. So to communicate what you understand or experience as resilience. So I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna put the timer on myself. Um, and let's not forget the uh, people who couldn't make it in person. It'd be lovely to just have a name drop or something like that at the end of our introductions. All right, here we go. Uh, so, hello, my name is Peter, Peter Hurd. I am from Salisbury in England. As I said, Stonehenge was for some time what I called my maunga, which is an important part of the Indigenous way of explaining who you are and where you're from, and always involves whakapapa, that is your ancestry. Uh, so my ancestry actually uh, goes back to Scotland, primarily in a bit of Ireland. And I'm in Taranaki in New Zealand uh, on the west coast. So good here. It's beautiful. And um, resilience. This is what resilience looks like to me sometimes. <laughs> this uh, beautiful friend of mine. In fact, this was my first really good guitar, which I gifted to my son. But um. I have no end of ways in which to make sense of my existence uh, using music to to sh to share the medicine with myself. Actually, uh, I write these things sometimes, and usually the, I write them in my lowest moment. And uh, three or four years ago, I realised that one of the ways I can soothe myself and support myself through really hard times is to play the music that I made about the hardest times of my life. And it really just lets me know that it's going to be okay. And that I'm, I'm strong and I've been through a lot. And I have ways of getting through these hard times. And it's just something happens in me when I play these songs that is so relieving and uh, it is resilience. So, so P Peter is modeling uh, what to do when the timer goes off. It doesn't mean you stop. Please finish your sentences, <laughs> complete your message. Don't be intimidated by the timer any more than you're intimidated by chronic conditions. Thank you, Stephanie, perfect. Um, okay, so, um, how are we going to do this? Am, uh, are we going to do nominating the next person, I think? So I'm going to nominate Cheryl. And then at the end of your talk, Cheryl, who would you like to go after you? So that oh, they can get themselves ready. Let's send it to Gerald so you can keep yourself awake and engaged over there. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Cheryl. Many of my dear friends and loved ones called me Wild Rose. So you're welcome to call me Rose as well. Um, I am originally from the United States from New York uh, where I grew up on the Hudson River, grew up taking long, long, long walks every weekend with my father. Um, 
And now I live out in Bellingham, well, actually outside of Bellingham, Washington, near Mount Baker, just beneath the border of Canada and Washington states. Beautiful. Another river that I live on now, um, the Nooksack River, which is the peoples who lived here, who I want to honor in naming this before I came here and were in profound relationship to this extraordinary land full of berries and salmon and bears and all the extraordinary things that are this land. Um, well, resilience is, um, well, it's everything really, it's particularly at this point in our, in our human evolution. And it, it instantly, as I read that, I thought of this song, singing is a big part of my world, putting my voice together with other voices is one of my, um, it brings out my resilience and it brings out that sense because it, it brings together connection. And so I thought of this song, it's, this, it's a song that I've been singing to Kai every night, my son, as he falls asleep. <clears throat> um, and it's, Gentle heart, gentle soul, gentle mind, mind. Life is change, love remains all the time, time. Gentle heart, gentle soul, gentle mind, mind. Life is change, love remains all the time, time. And there's something about that song that just acknowledges the truth, right, of change. And yet we can be so gentle. I love the use of the word gentle in that and really acknowledging how gentle and tender we really are for all of our resilience. I think our resilience comes from tenderness and gentleness with ourselves in particular, um, and which I think we'll be exploring quite a bit in this course. So, um, and the other thing for me, um, will be a visual. I'll just give you a little visual of the extraordinary place which I am inhabiting that I know is the source of incredible resilience for me. So this is the, the land that I get to live on right now. With the birds, owls and the coyotes and the cougars and Everybody who lives on this land with us, that is resilience, this, this more than human community. And I think that's, that's me. And so I'll just leave some silence because that's a good thing too for resilience until it's Gerald's turn. Thank you, Cheryl. One of my absolute favorite birds is singing right now. I don't know so many places in the world each of you are, but the varied thrush, which is just this sort of flute-like watery sound is singing in the background. Okay. So when you're ready, Gerald, um, you could begin by letting us know who will go next. And then do your share. I'd like to accept to come to me. Almost Gerald. hear you, Gerald, but not quite. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Actually, let me check. Yes, that's better. Is that better or the same? Yeah, that, that's better. Okay. I'd nominate Siv if she'd like to go next after me. 
I'm Joe from Sydney, Australia. That's not the problem, and that's where I am now at the moment. And my sense of resilience. There's a, a few, I, I, I picked some lyrics of a song and um, there's a few different ones, but the ones I liked at the moment are uh, We pick up right where we left off, breathe on the ashes that remain, so that these coals may become fire to guide our way. And my making sense of resilience has to do with rhythm, and I can get it with words and music, and also when they touch that inner rhythm that I have. And to me, there's something very special about having some inner rhythm. And that feels good for me to pause here. Yeah. Thank you, Gerald. Um, would you post the name of the song into the chat for us? Thank you. And so when yeah. you're ready. Please introduce yourself to us. Yeah, hello. I'm from I'm, yeah, I'm from Norway, and I can understand everything you say, but I'm not so good um, to speak English. And it's about uh, difficult to find words to describe what I want to say. <laughs> but I um, live one and a half hour from Oslo, and I'm from the north uh, in the country. But now I live in um, Fredrikstad. And I, uh, uh, I use uh, I work as a nurse, and uh, on my uh, free time I uh, do almost everything uh, to study uh, natural healing. <laughs> um, and uh, the best thing I can do for myself is uh, uh, stay in the nature and be alone. <laughs> and when I when I am um, on my free, uh, free time. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you, Sid. Who would you like to nominate to go next? Uh, I would like to nominate the um, lovely, beautiful Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you, lovely, beautiful Siv. And I feel so grateful that when she says, I am living in Friedrichstadt and I have been there uh, several times and I know exactly where she is. And also Gerald has been there, but I don't think Gerald met Siv. Uh, uh, Siv wasn't in that exact program, but I have had the joy of meeting Siv and her mother and her daughter as well. So I'm very happy that Siv is here. So uh, I am Stephanie and I am at this moment uh, outside of Portland, uh, but I live currently uh, on an organic farm in rural Oregon uh, where Cheryl has been um, uh, during this pandemic. Uh, no one has really been into my new studio. Uh, except for Cheryl and her gorgeous partner, Drew. And that area is um, the land of the Multnomah, the Clackamas, many, many tribes that actually had their feet on that land before uh, it was colonized uh, by greedy white people who um, think they own it. And the river there is the Sandy River and the mountain is Mount Hood. But I was born in New York. I was born in a tenement building in the Bronx, New York. And if I were to think of mountains, they would be tenements. Because uh, you couldn't see any mountains and you couldn't see any grass and you couldn't see any rivers. The Hudson Valley is much, much more lush and natural. Uh, it's not anything like the Bronx, 
for those of you who may not know New York. Um, I'm from uh, an immigrant um, shtetl-like community, shtetl meaning ghetto uh, in the Bronx. And I honor those people and I honor that cement and I honor all the suffering uh, and the joy uh, of those immigrant families that I did my best to connect to, even though I wasn't allowed to. I come from an Orthodox Jewish family that really doesn't want you to associate with anybody other than other Orthodox Jews, which I rebelled against instinctually without even knowing that I was rebelling against it. Uh, while at the same time being very devoted to my faith. So all of that is in my origins and in my own chronic conditions. Uh, so I will honor the resilience that to me is the spiritual gifts that seem to pour into me uh, unpredictably, uh, relentlessly, ceaselessly, amazingly, I bow to that resilience, which seems to be self-arising, heuristic of its own origins. And I nominate Trez. Thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie. Lovely to hear some of that that I didn't know. Um, so I'm Trace. I need to put on my glasses here because I can't see what I'm supposed to be saying. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm from I'm from Ireland. Uh, if you uh, originally from Dublin, the east coast of Ireland, and I'm now living in Sligo, which is in the northwest. Um, and uh, I guess resilience probably, hmm, I'm going to do a little bit like what Cheryl did. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, what offers me resilience. Oops. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Can hear you. Time I've had these yokes. Anyway, so I'm very fortunate to live in a beautiful spot. Uh, I don't know if you can see two grand mountains. Oh. You can see them there. One is Knock Moray, which is the, the hill of the Queen, Queen Maeve. And the flat mountain, flat back mountain, is Ben Bulban, uh, which some say is like Ayers Rock. Um, and this then is my garden, and this offers lovely resilience, or places of resilience, as does the smell of the roses, and uh, so it's a real place of sanctuary for me, and a real place of healing. Um, and movement, I would think, is a big thing for me in terms of resilience. I was teaching this morning a, a workshop on garden as studio. And uh, I went into the kitchen and danced for about a half an hour afterwards, uh, which was really lovely and wonderful. Um, and poetry. And I just happened to have a poem here uh, by called Hold Out Your Hand by a woman called Julia Ferenbacher. Um, and I just quote one or two lines. She says, well, a few lines. Do you see the, shun, the sun shines day after day, whether you have faith or not? The sparrows continue to sing their songs. Whoops. All right. Yep. We can hear you. Yep. The sparrows continue to sing their song, even when you forget to sing yours. 
Stop asking, am I good enough? Ask only, am I showing up with love? Life is not a straight line. It's a downpour of gifts. Please hold out your hand. So, thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Might be a nice poem to share into the Mighty Network. And could you maybe sure, write the, the name of the author of that poem in the chat? Sure, we'll do, Thanks. sure. Yeah, no problem. Who would you nominate to go next? Uh, so I nominate uh, Susan. Thank you, Trail. Uh, you might need to reset your Thank your you. earpiece again. The the voice is yeah. a bit odd. Yeah, Susan. Sure. Um, I'm Susan. Um, I currently live in Wales. I've lived in Wales for forty years um, and a bit. Um, I was born in England, in Surrey, uh, but um, when I moved to Wales, I, there was a call from the land, really. I felt really at home here, um, at home with the river, the trees, the seas. Um, and I've got ancestry in Scotland and in Ireland. And interestingly, when I went to Scotland and I went to Ireland, I also felt very at home on those lands. Um, um, the elements, living in the woods where I did for 40 years, the elements were actually my teachers. So I would run out of water in the summer. And so then I would be really careful as to how I used water and what I'd use it for. And I was very lucky to have a river outside my back door. So I could use that um, for, you know, water needs. Um, and there's something about that learning from the water that really stayed with me. Um, and I followed for, for my gardening, I'd follow the, the Steiner planting guide. And I don't know if any of you know about that, but um, there's a different time for planting, different, half the month is one and half the month is the other. So that there's a descending energy and a, and a rising energy and roots and fruits and leaves all get planted at different times. And when you're actually following that, well, for me anyway, I could check, I could feel the day change from one to, from one system to another. And there's something about being, feeling really connected. And um, so whatever the weather was doing, if it was plant carrots and it was pouring with rain, I'd be out there planting carrots because that was the time for the carrot to go in the ground. Um, without my mind questioning it. And because I'm not very disciplined, that was a discipline for me. I would just follow it happily, really, because it made sense somewhere. So my, my resilience or my go-to for resilience is always outside. It's to the river, to the trees, to the sea, just anywhere really outside where I feel immediately a connection and um, and there's that lovely vulnerability if you're walking down a country lane and you see the flowers, they're, they're transient, they're not there for long. Um, and it's just a real beauty to have that, that, just that glimpse. And you stop and smell something and the smell goes all the way through you in just such a beautiful way. Um, so it's in a way, it's like an inner embrace. Um, I think I'm very lucky, very, very lucky to be living where I am and able to do what I do, which is, you know, simple really. Um, and yeah, I'm endlessly thankful to nature really and my connection with nature. I think that's that's all I have to say. Oh, one of the other things that, that I will do is I'll, I'll open a book and it always seems to be open on the right page. And there'll be a few words there and there or yeah i'll come across words and there's something of john o'donoghue he's one of my favorite poets and he says may you allow the wild beauty of the invisible world to gather you mind you and embrace you in belonging and that really just totally speaks to me um that's it thank you thank you susan 
uh, some more words you might like to share into the chat or into the Mighty Networks. It's beautiful. Who is next? Oh, um, Liddy. My sound breaks up from now and then, so I hope this will work. Um, I'm Liddy. I'm from La Luxembourg, where I just spent two weeks back here, uh, 600 kilometers south, and um, resilience for me is like when I'm smiling, that's resilience, and when I manage, when I notice and then manage to just uh, relax and I learned I had to learn this like drop my shoulders and exhale and the fact that I learned it is resilience and the fact that I'm here is resilience <laughs> and but also like what happens when I go outside or even when I just take a stone in my hand what happens in my body when I do that, Michigan Lake. And I, I don't know, I was thinking about resilience and like I spent these two weeks with my parents and my dad, he's got a huge collection of coins from Luxembourg. And it has been used in Luxembourg before even Luxembourg was a country. So it's over hundreds of years, maybe a thousand. And so to sort this, I helped him now to make a fold of blah, blah, blah. And he has a list of and, and whatever these emperors and all these people that, that were handling this land to others and and but the Luxembourgish people are still like Luxembourgish people and that for me is somehow resilience too as a, it's it's about me and it's about bigger groups thank you thank you Lady Lady uh who, who would like you like, like to get to hear from Nalini Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So the, um, sorry, I just switched to my computer. So I'm just getting this set up. So my name is Nalini Yadav. I um, live here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, quite a hot day today. Um, very happy to not be in my work clothes. And my origins, my family is, um, both my parents are originally from India. And um, while that's always been my identity, a few years ago, I um, did the uh, 23andMe genetic testing. And uh, surprisingly, it came back to me and said that I was 99.999% from the Indian subcontinent. So, you know, very revealing. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, my parents came to this country you know, long before I was born and actually were living in Canada when I was born. So that's where I originally hail from, but they promptly moved to Georgia when I was not even a month old. So my life has been here other than the seven years I actually spent in Hawaii uh, working on my PhD. And that is where I was destined to come across uh, the Tara approach with um, one of Stephanie's students, uh, Tristan, who is going to be watching this. Hi, Tristan, later on. <laughs> um, and then she introduced me to the practice as well as, um, apologies, my phone's going off. Let's try it off. Um, still a work day for other people. So um, just knew that this was something that was, what I wanted to do. I had always been drawn to uh, 
natural um, healing, energy healing, homeopathic ways. And when this came to me, I knew that this was what the universe was sending to me. And at a time where I needed more help than I'd ever needed in my entire life. Um, if anyone tells you that getting a PhD is easy, they're lying or they didn't do it right. It was the hardest thing I probably have ever done so far in my life. I don't have kids, so can't count that. But I was lucky enough then to be introduced to Stephanie and the journey from there has completely revised what my life was going to be. And in my mind, only in positive ways, I would not have completed that PhD if I didn't have this practice. And uh, where I am now is back at home in Atlanta. I have my own home. <laughs> and um, resilience means to me the faith that when change is going to happen, because it's inevitable that change happens, whether or not you're happy with your current state or you want things to change or not, it's going to happen. And resilience is having that faith that knowing whether that change is positive or negative in your own perception is that that change is going to be what's supposed to be. So to me, that's sort of where I go with resilience. And I think um, I can show you one of the things I've been so lucky enough to be able to actually pursue some um, things that I love. One of the one things that I love is dancing, but I won't um, dance in front of you, but I will show you if you can see here, this painting that I made recently. And what's interesting about it is at first I thought I was making lily pads and then they looked like avocados. And then once I started making the flowers, I realized that I was just looking in a mirror because um, my name, Nalini, actually means a pink lotus flower. So I think the universe says things to us in many, many different ways. While I was trying so desperately to be compassionate towards everyone around me that was going through so much, especially here in Atlanta last year, and a lot of pretty crazy things happened along with the pandemic and everything else. I think the universe was telling me, don't forget to focus on yourself. So, happy to pass that on to someone else who has not gone yet. Beautiful. Thank you, Nalini. Nalini. Um, there's just Sue, I believe. Okay. Sue, on to you. Oh, I guess you can all hear me now. Yes. So I am about an hour south of Denver, Colorado. I'm in a beautiful um, little valley between these gorgeous old female red rocks. Um, if you know anything about Red Rocks Amphitheater, it's very famous, at least in the United States. And it's just, it's beautiful. And the energy here is wonderful. And if I'd known we were gonna do this, I would have tried to be outside so you could see. Um, it's delightful to be part of Jin Shin Tara in some way. Uh, Stephanie said a couple of times earlier that, um, I don't even remember the first time, probably 30 plus years ago, um, Stephanie was my first introduction to Jinshin and my first teacher and studied with her for as long as I could. And then uh, Nalini went on and also got a doctorate. Why do we do that? But, you know, it's a process. <laughs> um, and so Jinshin for me is a big river of resilience. I, I don't think I've I wouldn't be here without it today. I don't think I've ever stopped listening to it, um, using it, whatever, since way back when, Stephanie, when you first talked to me. Um, and 
resilience is also what I spend a lot of time with uh, all of my patients, uh, looking for it, reminding them of it, saying it's a big river, there's plenty for all of us. <laughs> uh, you know, the last year has been pretty remarkable in terms of that, certainly. Um, and much as like the first time I wound up bumbled, bumbled into Stephanie's class, uh, this came across my email and I thought, oh, I have to find this time. I have to come to this. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Very nice to have you with us. Ah, so everybody has gone. Is that correct? Yeah. This is us. What a crew. Um, we're uh, just going to take a minute to breathe all this in. So give yourself some space to absorb what we've done so far today. Part of what will support us to deepen into this space together is to have a collective culture of how we be together. And um, I'm going to copy what we have found works well into the chat. And please check in on that. And um, if you notice anything's missing or uh, doesn't sit well with you, then you can message me directly or put it into the chat. And um, Really, these are some ways that generate safety. So if you have ideas about what would make you feel more safe and comfortable in the space, then please contribute them to this group culture statement, uh, some guidelines for how we be together. Do you have anything to add about the culture, Stephanie? Or are you ready to move through the program? I just wanted to mention that I have loaded onto the Mighty Networks channel resources. Uh, most of you are already familiar with those resources, but these are compiled reminders of ways that Jin Shintara holding these sites adds to your resilience when you are activated. So it would be very natural to be activated in some way. Being activated is not a bad thing at all. Being activated means your attention is heightened and you are becoming aware of something that is speaking to you. It is a communication through your nervous system. Activation is always associated with nervous system activity. So something may activate you and in that activation you may lose focus you may be distracted and that may perseverate that may carry on uh, for the rest of the class or into the evening or uh, whatever time frame you're in please allow the resources of Jin Tara the hands-on communication with your nervous system, not to get you out of it, not to fix it so that you're back where you were before, because that's not the point of the activation, but to allow you to learn what that activation is communicating to you and then integrate and assimilate that gracefully. So to me, that is one of the greatest blessings of this system. It was I feel somewhat of a missing piece in the Wisdom of Trauma series, which I believe almost everyone here has watched recently. If you haven't, I recommend it to you. Uh, it's still available uh, through the 20th, which is a very important and momentous presentation on 
most of the aspects of trauma and shock trauma and brings the concept of trauma informed into a more general understanding, long overdue and very much needed, particularly at this time. So those resources are there for you, nicely collected, illustrated, and you are welcome to download those and print them out and share them with other people. Uh, I am very pleased to make that available. I do appreciate it if you refer to the TAR approach as the source of those resources. And along those lines, if you uh, need support during this course, any of the days of it, you can message me privately. That's one of my roles here is to be available for you should you need clarity or you have an activation or your resources disappear for the reasons of shock or any other reason, just uh, hit me up. I'm here for you. And rest assured, we will be taking a break. Um, I know that already uh, there's so much depth that has been communicated. Um, so we have some teaching to do now. Does, do you all feel like you would like to take a break now? A five minute break. Uh, yeah, Gerald is in for a five minute break and so is Trez. I say, let's take a five minute bio break and uh, we'll be back in five. Thank you. So we are going to be diving into this material of opening these portals to the daunting and often intimidating chronic conditions that we face in ourselves, that our family members face, and that our patients and clients face. And as I mentioned before, I welcome you articulating in the chat, to me personally, however you're the most comfortable, what particular chronic mm -hmm. conditions you have a personal and professional interest in so that I can zero in on those situations. I know a little bit about those for some of you in your practices or in your lives. But if you are comfortable in sharing those that you want to investigate, I, in the current way that I operate dominantly, would invite the collective wisdom that we represent as a resource, as well as whatever experience I have in my years of practice and in my deep immersion in this energy medicine system. And of course, I am fusing that with my understanding about neurodevelopment and the impacts of shock and trauma on that neurodevelopment. So we want to first explore the nature of chronic conditions to begin with. What are they actually? What are they to us personally? What are they academically? What are they in the collective consciousness? And we want to be able to individuate from the ways in which other people define chronic conditions and come to our own understanding of that. And that is really critical from my standpoint. And I will say that that became really clear to me, particularly in my work with neurodiverse children, some of whom were completely nonverbal, uh, some of whom had very awkward and behaviors that were distressing to other people. Uh, to be able to see these youth as individuals, uh, as people of great potential, as people of great intelligence, yearning to communicate and to be recognized and seen for who they were, and instead always being seen as being a condition. So we want to break that trance, which is obfuscating, which uh, undermines intelligence, which is a form of colonization of the mind and uh, creativity and the imagination and collective 
healing wisdom. And we want to be able to come to our own definition of chronic conditions within ourselves and others. So Peter and I are going to talk a little bit about the chronic conditions that we deal with, just as a demonstration of this briefly. Um, but I do want to say that the definition goes beyond physiology uh, in terms of, for instance, autism could be named as a chronic condition. Multiple sclerosis could be named as a chronic condition. Um, cancer could be named as a chronic condition. But there are also uh, chronic conditions of the mind. Those are far more common, I believe. And I believe that I met my teacher, Mary, for instance, because of chronic conditions in my own life that were not apparently physiological. Of course, they are physiological because they're neurological, but there was, they were invisible. The invisible chronic conditions have equal weight to the visible ones. So uh, just to share very briefly uh, a few of my own chronic conditions, I would say when I met Mary uh, in California, I was suffering from the ramifications of a chronic traumatic repetition uh, relational behavior. And I, I had chronically been involved in relationships that were destructive. And I would say behind that chronic traumatic repetition that stemmed from my own family dynamics, there was a deeper chronic condition, which I would call the chronic condition of self-sabotage and self-destructiveness that also evolved if I were to trace it to the root cause out of being the survivor of my mother's attempts to abort me and my father's wish that I not live and just the awkwardness of my conception and the time in which I chose to be born. That whole phenomena was a uh, seed of this chronic pattern of self-sabotage which I would say to some extent, I'm definitely still dealing with in, in a variety of forms, but I can identify it and name it. So on the physiological level, there was in addition to that, a chronic condition of asthma, which I'm also still dealing with, but like the other one that I described, the awareness and the resources that I bring to the understanding for me of the root causes of those conditions. So this is my experience. In my comprehension of the root causes of those conditions, plus coupled with the use of energy medicine, I have been able to make those chronic conditions much much less intrusive in my life. I, I would say that those chronic conditions shaped my life. The self-sabotaging and the asthma shaped my life. And I would say that they no longer shape my life. And the role of the energy medicine for me was the direct communication with my nervous system that was palpable and virtually immediate. And that immediate response was both physiological, meaning symptomatically, I was more comfortable. And through the awareness that accompanied that symptomatic relief, those two have always been paired for me in my use of this system, which is why the neuroscience component was a very natural outcome for me in my doctoral studies, which I loved. I'm sorry, I know that Nalini would say maybe I didn't do it right, but the opportunity to deeply dive into research and investigation and to really explore 
uh, clinically, uh, academically in the literature is actually something I completely relish and I still do. Certainly there were aspects of it that were less fun, but to me it was so incredibly worth it because it was a carved out space for investigation. So asthma and I would say self-sabotage are two of the chronic conditions that I feel I have been successful with and that helped me to understand the trajectory, the pathway of addressing chronic conditions with the caveat that each individual's relationship to their chronic conditions has to be seen in the light of that person's life that is absolutely essential uh, from my standpoint. So for the last few years, I've also been dealing for the first time really with a lingering leg injury and a right uh, knee injury, knee and upper leg. Uh, and it, I've made enormous progress uh, from uh, two years ago when this started uh, to now, my range of motion, my endurance, um, my pain levels are just remarkably improved, but I still have it. Uh, and so the question that a medical professional would pose for me is, well, do you wanna just live with it the way it is? Or do you wanna have a surgery? Because it's possible that a surgery uh, might make a difference. Also, it could make it worse, <laughs> but you know, it's your choice. You know, do you want to live with it as it is or have a surgery? And I choose neither. <laughs> I choose neither uh, at this point. I could elect a surgery at some juncture, but the improvement is on a rise, not at the rate that I'm used to. I'm used to rapid recovery. I don't have a lot of patience for long-term recovery uh, because I have another chronic condition, which is compression. Compression. <laughs> Let's compress everything and get the most done in the shortest amount of time. This is another one of my chronic conditions. Um, how much can I pack in? Uh, so this situation with my knee, my leg, my right leg um, continues to be a teacher for me in terms of that chronic condition. And I will say that I'm still learning about its root cause and I am interested in continuing to learn about it. I have some ideas. Uh, it's definitely related to everything I've already said, but that's, that's my relationship uh, to my personal chronic conditions. So I've identified a few of them to give you the flavor of what we're gonna be doing next um, and how we're gonna initially very humanistically, very personally approach chronic conditions to individuate from the academic and medical literature, not to discard it, not to throw it out, but to differentiate from it, to provide an alternate pathway, a, an integrated pathway, a supportive pathway. Does this make sense? And Peter, can you share? Um, well, I've got an unresolved chronic condition and a, what I feel like is a resolved chronic condition. Uh, so the resolved chronic condition was depression and anxiety, which I suffered from for about 20 years in various forms and responded to it in different ways from self-medicating to, you know, taking uh, pharmaceutical medications, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, turn to spirit work, you know, all sorts of things. So for 20 years, I would get a seasonal uh, depression and be anxious on and off, sometimes severely. Um, and it reached the head uh, three or four years ago when, when I first came, that's when I first came to seek 
for new medicine and I found the Tara approach and uh, saw the root cause of that, found out how my story had written this timeline of being prone to depression and anxiety into my adult existence. And through addressing that root cause, um, I've just had one episode actually since then, uh, uh, which kind of, um, you know, kicked my ass <laughs> because I thought I had nailed it, but I came to realize a deeper understanding of what resolution looks like and uh, to realize that I had options out of that and I took the options out of that. So um, uh, it may return and, uh, and hopefully I have the tools at my fingertips at the time, or at least I can recognize I'm in shock, which is eventually what I did when it returned last time. I recognized I'm in shock. Peter, why aren't you using any of your tools? Oh, yeah, that's a sign of shock. Treat yourself as shock. And then I came out of that, um, that little bump. Uh, another condition I have which is unresolved is migraines. And it's a big fat bug bear in my life at the moment. I had one just yesterday. And, uh, you know, I've explored a lot of options around migraines. Treating them causes... Um, responses, um, root, where does it come from? Um, it's an ongoing inquiry. And in fact, they seem to have gotten worse over the last two or three years. And yeah, this kind of despair rises up in me when I get a migraine. Uh, it's like a, a very defeated, um, hedonistic kind of response to this pain. As I do whatever I can to avoid the pain. So I'm working with that um, as a condition which is persistent over a very long time and seems unresponsive in many ways to, to change. Um, there's another condition which kind of calls me to talk about, but I'm not quite sure how to frame it. But uh, it was this thing that I needed to do as a child to stay safe, to create safety. Uh, and I found in my adult life that I was habitually, unconsciously creating safety wherever I went through my work. In fact, the safety I was creating was for myself. I needed to create safety for me, and I ended up in all these kind of works and events and projects that I was doing in which I could generate the safe space, and I was actually doing that to make myself feel safe. And it wasn't until I realized that and, and stopped that and gave it a pause that I could come back to it in a more resolved way uh, in which I can choose when to do that now. I don't have to do it habitually in order to uh, generate safety for myself. Under the cloak of generating safety for others, I can um, offer that as an asset and I don't need to habitually do it. The safety now is available from within myself. So that was a chronic condition for 38 years, however long I've been alive, of really knowing how to scan for safety and generate safety, uh, which I'm, I'm out of the traumatic repetition of. Beautiful. So I, I'm going to add uh, a note that I think is in your materials uh, from uh, Dr. Mate again. He says that chronic illness is your body saying no when that no was previously suppressed, impossible to express, and that no being contained in your cellular structure leads to the chronic condition in the form that your body manifests it. And I would say that is useful. It may not be the answer in all cases. And it does not imply, and I do not at any point want us to imply that anyone is to blame for their chronic condition. It is the chronic condition is not the result of a mistake that you made by not saying no or anything at all. Um, so, I want to be sure that we don't go down that pathway. I don't expect that we would, but others have. And uh, I, I want to just uh, detour away from that 
tendency. And again, I continually go back to the individuated approach. There is the understanding of the physiology of the chronic condition. For instance, with the asthma, it's an e a really excellent example because there is a certain physiology around the manifestation of the asthmatic patterns. But I do want to say that, you know, throughout my uh, journey into what others have referred to as natural healing, I have been told a lot of bullshit about asthma. I have been told, for instance, that I am, and, and these are by people who deliver this information, you know, really trying to help me, which is probably the worst attitude you can have, you know, which is, you know, well, you, you're using the asthma to get the attention you can't ask for. Uh, uh, or just let yourself breathe, Stephanie. Just slow down, just let yourself breathe. Okay, what we're gonna do now, Stephanie, is we are gonna breathe together. I'm gonna breathe with you. Let's breathe together. No, deeper, Stephanie, deeper. You know, your breath is really shallow. You really have to let go. Why can't you do it? Just, just let, just release, let go. Hold your ring finger. Let your lungs relax. Just let go and breathe. Just do it, just do it. So uh, it was fascinating to me to discover uh, just really, I think about 10 years ago that um, I actually have a congenital uh, deformation in my lung structure. Th this came out of, I had a, actually had to have x-rays and MRIs because of a lot of pain that I was having, sudden enormous amount of pain. Normally it would have to be so extreme for me to go to that extent but that resulted in the discovery that I have a congenital lung defect. I had never known that before. My, the way that my lungs are formed, um, it, I have uh, sequestered lung tissue. So I have some, I produced extra lung tissue and I sequestered it within the structure of my respiratory system, uh, which was probably an act of brilliance on my part to somehow create this extra lung tissue. Uh, except that because there's this extra tissue, I cannot physically breathe deeply. It's just not possible. Unless I had a surgery, which of course the doctors recommended uh, that I have a surgery to remove this sequestered lung tissue, which I decline. Um, but there you have it, you know, the um, spiritual bypass, good intentioned, just do this approach is ignorant and harmful and makes someone uh, kind of fenced in uh, in terms of what they think their options are or even who they are. So I am. Uh, really going to dissuade you from any of those cheery little helpful approaches and instead invite you into a genuine authentic curiosity. Uh, so we are actually going to go into breakout rooms and have the opportunity to explore with each other uh, what our own chronic conditions might be. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, share with you one of these treasures from this program, which is an alternate way of touching the sites. So this alternate way of touching the sites, and we're gonna focus on sacred site number 26, which is behind the armpit, right? And what I'd like you to do is, yeah, and Peter is gonna use the esteemed gentleman to direct us to sacred site number 26. So find it, just let your hand rest on it. And then once you've landed, I just raise my arm so that I can 
get into that tissue. You want to feel comfortable holding sacred site number 26. You're not pressing or exerting any force. You're simply being present and just breathe into that. I have to rearrange this headset. Here we go. And you might want to close your eyes just so that you are in more of a sensory relationship to your touch. And it could be the right side or the left side, it doesn't matter. You might wanna ground yourself, that always adds power to treatment. Make sure that your feet are grounded on the earth, that you feel a relationship to the earth so that you have support in the lower part of your body. If you're seated, you want your sit bones to really make contact with the surface you're sitting on. And direct your attention into sacred site number 26. And before we do anything further, just allow your fingertips to notice, is there any tension or congestion in this site? So how would you know there was tension or congestion? It could be that the site is actually tender to the touch. It, might feel somewhat like a bruise. Or the other possibilities are a kind of granular or rocky or dense or even a larger kind of ball-like feeling within the four inch radius that we know is appropriate for every single site. So just explore that for a moment. Notice if there is pulsation, notice whether there's any quality of any of those adjectives that I just used. And now I want to invite you to use one of your fingers could be your index or your middle, those are the likely candidates, to orient towards any level of density, any one of those adjectives that I used uh, on the spectrum of slightly to considerable. And let that finger touch a little more deeply into that density. So I'm gonna give you a moment here to feel that. Don't worry about writing down these instructions because they're in your handbook. So this may be nuanced, it may be experimental. Don't worry about it, just play with it. You cannot do any harm as you know. So as you reach a little bit more into that density with either the index or the middle finger, I'm using my middle finger. I found the area of greatest density. Press a little bit more. So what you're doing, you're not really pressing to do anything in particular. You're not trying to make something happen. You're pressing to get more into what is known as the core of the site. And indeed, this could be called a core approach. I also call it a functional release. So as you go with your finger, probing a little more into what could be the core of this density, I'm going to invite another inquiry into your intention. And that inquiry is in this density that I am now connecting to at its core, is there any movement? 
Is there any movement at all? Is there any give? Is there any space in this little area that has movement potential? So just have that as your intention. And if you don't find that, don't worry, just play with it. Just make it up so that you begin to have the experience. This is very new. So we have to start somewhere. Yeah, so I found that movement. The intention really helps. It'll make that tiny microscopic area of movement rise more to the surface. So when you find that, let that finger follow that movement. There we go, it's happening for me. I hope that you're experiencing something that resonates for you that has some productivity. And then you're gonna follow the movement. You're just, you're just following, you're not doing anything here. You're following the movement. You can hear in my voice that I'm onto something here. And you're gonna follow that movement until it is done moving to the end of its circuit. You follow that movement. And then maybe a little further, but not doing anything to it. So this is very subtle movement, but it is movement with contact. It's not on the surface of the connective tissue. It's deeper than that. It's a different kind of movement than we have been recommending through all of the Jinshin teachings that you have experienced. This is a deeper probing kind of movement, a deeper contact, a deeper engagement with the site. And you're gonna follow it to the end of the movement potential. And then perhaps a little bit more without effort and then release, remove your hand and play with it on the opposite side, just to give you more experience uh, with this core movement technique. This is the way that Mary always treated. You always treat it at the core level. At least uh, that's my experience as one of her students. So she was teaching about very gentle treatment and she was treating like this. Stephanie, does that mean Mary would be doing this core movement on every site she held if it was called for in that site? Uh, you know, of course, I don't know how she treated everybody else. I only know how she treated me and that she was treating me as one of her loyal students. Um, but she was known uh, amongst her students as fingers of steel. That's what people called her, fingers of steel. That was their description of Mary. So nobody ever asked her to bridge that gap between what she was teaching and how she was treating. But she was called fingers of steel. And there were occasions when people would scream from receiving her treatment. So I am sure that she went back and forth between different styles of palpation and that quite likely she only did this uh, when she felt it was appropriate. Um, but I don't personally know because I only received what I received from her. Um, sometimes I don't notice like any of the signs that you said, but I feel the site asking me to move. So is this another way that transmission can be received of a functional release? Yes, I would say so. So this is not to say that the gentle approach is negated and now you should only treat like this. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm offering this approach 
within the context of chronic conditions. And I am suggesting that you experiment with it on yourself. So let's take a moment here before we go any further for you to notice, those of you who have done this, to notice the results. What do, if you did this, what do you feel in that 26 area, if anything? I notice my back, which has been painful for the last 45 minutes, my lower back above my sacrum has now softened. It feels like it's letting go. And the right side of my body, which I spent more time on the functional release on, I can notice the energy coming up now into my 12s. Uh, feels like things are moving where before they were not. And my left side, in, quite in contrast, which I didn't really release, which I'll do now as we're chatting, is feeling stiff. I'm sorry, I foolishly took a look at the chat, so I missed that last. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to do that. Could you repeat what you just said about that last little piece? Uh, the left side, conversely, is stiff, so I will treat it now. Okay. Okay, because you hadn't treated the left side before. I did a little bit, but during the guided thing, I treated my right side, and now I notice the release and the flow. And the left side now is obviously not released or flowing in the same way. Yeah. I will just say that my chest, I would say particularly my breasts, if I may say so, feel really wide. My chest feels really wide open. Uh, and it feels like that area of my back behind my breasts is expanding to support that widening across the chest. Anybody else notice anything from doing this core release? I'm noticing what you were just speaking to, Peter, I was noticing the same thing that my back was opening up and then it was really bringing a lot of heightened awareness to some tension in my 13s on the kind of front of my ribs. And I can feel, um, as I'm doing that, I can kind of feel some like uh, deeper level grief that's kind of moving and needing to move um, that that's inviting. Wow. Anyone so, else? Well, yeah. My 13. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Cheryl. Oh, I was just finishing. I realized I didn't finish my thought, which I often do. <laughs> so I was just holding my 13s and letting that move. Anyone else want to comment? And if you didn't notice anything or you're confused or anything, you can also say that. It doesn't have to all be positive or dramatic. <laughs> Gerald. For me, it's a, uh, the uh, quality of my attention has changed, I guess, in a sensory way. I can notice the, the absence of the effort that I was having before when I was concentrating or thinking really hard about listening. And now it's a it's become a little bit more easeful to be president. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. I feel the same, actually. It's easier for me to be teaching in this moment, mm -hmm. having done that, um, than it was prior. Yeah. Susan. Um, I would say that um, for me, that both of those points um, feel now awake. It's like, I bothered to listen to them mm. and, and they're, they're, yeah, so they're very pleased in a way. They feel heard. Beautiful. Anyone else want to say anything? Trez? Yeah, may, yeah, may I say, um, Stephanie, so it, in the dense, in moving more gently into the density, and then to get a, a, 
don't know that I'd describe it as a movement, but a very clear signal, if you like, across the back between the shoulder blades. And, and so then I moved very gently with that, sort of going over to the right. And then get a release right down into the right foot. There's something happening down there. So is it, but when you say the movement, is that what you mean? That you follow? You know, it's likely going to be different for every person. So I really don't think it's valuable for me to get highly detailed about what that movement might be because we all have different perceptual skills. I will say that for me, I feel in that density, a cellular or connective tissue shift so that there's actually movement out of the density. And I'm actually following that connective tissue that is moving. Um, okay. But that doesn't mean that that's what everybody else will experience. For me, it's very physiological. It's palpable. It's a movement in the tissue that my fingertips are following. This is one of the reasons we have the very short fingernails or no fingernails, you know, that helps a lot that it's the really the pad of your finger that's following. You need that whole pad to mm. find this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Sue, did you have something? Suz Suzanne. Um, yes, I had a, a very similar experience. I, I feel really opened and easier to listen than just fully you know, take in everything. And I will just mention that Stephanie is, as always, uh, so shy about her own great gift and talents. Uh, Mary certainly had fingers of steel. And in the group that I initially learned with from Stephanie, we used to accuse her of using pointed sticks instead of her fingers. <laughs> So I think, Stephanie, you've probably just intuitively been treating the core level, just as you learned from Mary forever. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously, uh, you want to be judicious with the use of this new tool that you have. And you can be playful with yourself, <laughs> you know, uh, before perhaps you start experimenting on others, but we'll have more opportunities to talk about this. Susan Roberts, did you want to say something further? Mm -mm, no. Okay. All right. So I brought this in here at this juncture to help us do what I believe is important in taking a look at chronic conditions with a fresh perception, a fresh intention and differentiated from anything at all. And uh, now I would like you to use that spaciousness, which I hope you're all feeling to some extent. We're gonna go into breakout rooms. Uh, Peter, do you wanna describe the breakout rooms? I would love to describe the breakout rooms. Um, <laughs> we're going to have a breakout room where you're paired up with one other one other person, and you've got um, a process which we're going to repeat. So one person firstly will be sharing, and the other person will be listening. Um, so I will copy the instructions not only into the group chat but into your um, into the breakout rooms when you go to them. And so the idea is that one person will be sharing your chronic conditions and you'll be returning to an, a, a, a continuation of this assessment exercise and, and reflection exercise later on in the same pairs. So this pair that you go to now will be repeated later on. Uh, so one person will share their chronic condition uh, in response to this question, what comes up for you in regards to chronic conditions? The listener is 
not there to fix anything or remedy anything or do anything really except for listen deeply and make sure that they understand what the person's listening. So reflective questions are, are useful if you need to clarify. Um, do take notes when you're the listener and the aim for the listener is to have a good sense of what you've learned from the other person. So one sharer, one listener, and then there'll be a swap. So I'll send a message to the room when it's time to swap and you switch roles. So who was listening before will become the sharer. And of course, as always, you are being spontaneous. You know, you may not have a sense of any chronic conditions. Just use the space to explore. Uh, yeah. Any questions on that? Okay, so uh, is it two times five minutes? Great question, Liddy. Yes, you'll get five minutes to share while the other person listens and then it'll swap. So there'll be around about 10 minutes in total. So pay good attention because this is gonna be your partner uh, because we're gonna be returning uh, so to these groups uh, to sequence things through. So take notes if you want to, but you know, be aware that you, know, you want your full presence as the listener. So shortly you're gonna be sent to your rooms. <laughs> <laughs> In the best possible way. And um, if you have any questions, you can message me or, or come back to the, the main room. All right. Uh, wave the magic wand. Here we go. Welcome back from the breakout room. We're just going to do a bit of stretching to get some movement back in the body. And I learned this one from a Tai Chi class that I did many years ago, uh, is that your arms extend all the way out. And uh, as your arms are extended out, you just gently uh, orient your fingers backwards away from the front backwards towards the back of your uh, in that direction and my Tai Chi teacher used to say that this little tingling that you feel along now the front of your chest possibly in the front of your arms is chi and Nalini is perfectly demonstrating this you might not be as stretchy as Nalini but she's orienting her hands backwards with her palms outwards and uh, my Tai Chi teacher said that that feeling as you stretch your fingers backwards is the flow of Chi. It is energy moving through your body. And reach right up and even bring your eyes and your head upwards as well. And let's twist our body as you maintain mentally twisting through the upper half of your body. Maintaining that upwards visual. And fold a little bit forwards, allow that energy of outward to become inward. Just allow your head to drop. Allow the weight of your head to be felt. Oh. And when you're ready, come back up. Huh. And you really are, I... of course, totally welcome to continue movement during this class. You are welcome to turn your video off. You're welcome to take a break from listening. You're welcome to meet your own needs, which is one of those culture things that we invite in to create safe spaces. You don't have to stay here. If you need a little break, you can go for it. Take the space you need for yourself. Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Peter. So uh, we are, as Peter said, not going to debrief what you shared in your breakout rooms, uh, but we do want to hear the chronic conditions or the issues that, was, that were harvested. And we did harvest the ones that were put into the chat. And Liddy, I want you to know that uh, I did read your note about that movement on your back through your shoulder blades. Uh, so I'm aware of it and keep informing us how that is playing out. So what we wanna do now is collect those issues 
that were shared. And I want you to know that it's not that I'm going to provide a recipe fix it for each one of these conditions. That's not the point of doing this is to give me an enormous amount of homework. I've already got plenty of that. <laughs> but the idea is that as the class unfolds and as the teaching material evolves, I can reference these issues. And when you return to your breakout groups with your partners, you will be factoring what you've learned relative to these issues and thereby exploring your own capacity to address these conditions. So let's hear them. Um, maybe starting with, I'm just looking at my screen, uh, Suzanne. Um, just me. Yeah. So what, what I talked about or what I am what, partner? Yeah, let's do, uh, thank you for clarifying. So why don't you share what your partner shared with you? And that way we will hear how your uh, reception to these issues were, was received. And, the, and if there's an error in the delivery, the person who's being referenced can make that correction. And that way we'll be sure that we understand what our partner said. Okay. Does that makes sense? Yes, it does. Great. Um, can I just, uh, sorry, get a clarification here. It feels like then we'll debrief and also we might enter a situation where we're going to share some information on someone's behalf that maybe they didn't know was going to the group. So um, can I suggest an alternative? Sure. Um, we're trying to harvest the kind of conditions people are interested in. So maybe each person could share what they personally are interested in or, or that that rose up. Is that okay? Uh, that's okay with me. Um, but I just wanted to be clear that all we're doing here, we're not sharing any information. We're just saying, so for instance, if I was sharing what I learned from you, Peter, I would be sharing migraines and depression. And then I would say, is that, was there anything more, Peter? Is that accurate? That's it. Yeah, so that, that would enter that situation where maybe you would be sharing something on my behalf, which I didn't want to share with the group. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. so it might be, um, I'm seeing a few nods as well. Uh, it might be that you could share the conditions you're interested in. Okay. Is that Great. okay? So oh, do you want to start absolutely there? okay. <sighs> well, I'm not completely clear. So I'm sharing no, my no, stuff. Yep. Yes, we're going to do a round where people share the conditions they're interested to explore a bit more in this course. Yep, so it might be yours, it might be a family members, it might be somebody you work no, with. No, 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 there's a misunderstanding here. So let, let me be clear again. Let's, the purpose of this moment that we're sharing here is only related to the breakout rooms. I'm not collecting the broad spectrum of chronic conditions that you're interested in. People already shared a few of those in the chat. I don't want any more. I just want what is in the room. That's all I'm interested in right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think I understand. And I would share what my partner identified as issues of interest to her and then stop. Well, that was my original suggestion, but Peter made an alternate suggestion, which I'm fine with. It doesn't really matter. Um, my, my hope is that what you heard from your partner is completely clear and accurate. That's important. Uh, and maybe you already verified that in your breakout rooms. Um, so Peter suggested the alternate that you share what your particular chronic issues are, not your partners, but your own. I'd like to say something. Yes. For me, I'm not so comfortable sharing the other's experience in the sense 
when I went into the breakout room, I wasn't told before that I would be bringing their experience to the replay to all my my take on what was happening in there. I would have had a different uh, interaction if I had known that later on I'm going to be talking on what I heard from someone else, but that's just my opinion on that. Yes, thank you, Gerald. I think we do need some clarification. Something I thought was simple apparently is not. So all I'm hoping for here for the purpose of this process being of service is to know what issues are in the room. None of the background to it. You know, when Peter and I shared our chronic conditions, we gave a lot of background. That's not what I'm looking for here. I'm just looking for what those issues are. And, and actually, we could even dispense with this entire thing. <laughs> it might not even be necessary. Um, because as long as you know what those issues are, uh, I'm likely to touch on resources anyway. So and we find it's really helpful to hear people articulate, like hearing one of Peter's was like, oh my God, yes. So a really brief run through out loud, I think could have a lot of value. If we're, what I'm hearing in summary is let's say our own conditions that we set in the breakout room and get them out collective. If that's okay. It, it's okay with me either way, but I wanna make sure it's okay with everybody. Do, is there a preference that we do what Cheryl just described? Or we can also, if the majority feels they'd rather just skip this piece, if that is also completely fine. This does, from my standpoint, this is in your service. It's it, so that I can be orienting somewhat towards these issues, um, but I'm sure I'll touch on them anyway. Yeah. Uh, so there's a quick way to check in on that. Thumbs up if you want to share about your own chronic health condition a little bit, set, like just the name of it, for example. There's a couple. Three, okay. Four. Maybe just, just those who want to share can share. Yeah. And those who don't want to, don't. Yeah. Good. Always an option. <laughs> so Maybe let's start with the stardust. What did you say, Sherry? You got cut off. Oh, I asked if Sue wanted to start us now that we have the instructions clear. Oh, why not? <laughs> so I, I would uh, share what was on my list. Um, I have uh, chronic celiac, which mm. is a digestive issue. And uh, despite very uh, committed dietary monitoring, I still have symptoms, right? Comes and goes, although I'm eating very cleanly and all of that jazz. Um, my suspicion is it's tied to workaholism, which is another thing that I talked a little about in the room. And I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl, do you want to go next? Mm, I do, and I was just tracking a message from Liddy where she did ask me to summarize for her because she is breaking up too much. We had to work really hard to catch each other. Um, so Liddy, feel free to send me a message if I misrepresent anything. Sugar addiction, joint pain and inflammation. Excuse me, are you speaking for Liddy here right I now? now? Okay, yeah. thank you. Joint pain and inflammation respiratory issues, sleeping disorder, hypervigilance, particularly around sleeping, restless leg syndrome, sprained ankles, anxiety and depression that has been improving, um, a more in relationship, a more critical nature 
and then um, holding a lot of fear of abandonment and rejection. And then she has really kindly, thank you, summarized mine, which I will speak to. And Liddy, please connect, correct anything I said. So for me, I named, as you know well, Stephanie, over responsibility, which leads to a sense of feeling overburdened. Panic, which ha I have been working with diligently, have many tools and still visits. And, um, and the need for earth treatments and remedies like spleen and stomach to no end. And that's my list. Thank you, Cheryl. Who would like to go next? I'll go next. Um, so mine is a weakness of my bladder. Um, and a reluctance to ask for help. I, I always do things on my own or think I can do things on my own. Um, yeah, I'm, there's a vigilance there. So I'm, I'm always aware and fear can creep in. Um, the vigilance and the fear are much better, but they're, they're still there. Um, and I'm, I can be over available to other people and not that available to myself. Um, and I've got a, an, an issue on my right knee um, and a bit of me understands it and a bit of me doesn't. Um, and it comes and goes. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Well, it, yeah. Yeah, the shares on those conditions. I think I put my hand up as well. Um, so uh, a tendency to excavate. <laughs> so excavate. I would find myself excavate, doing things like this and really picking to the uh, to the nth degree. Uh, um, can, I, can I just ask you, you put your hand on your head and is that the area yeah. that, is it the head or is it the hair? It's the head. And in that place that you put your hand, would that yeah. be the place, that particular place? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and usually associated with a kind of a nervousness or an anxiousness or whatever, I'd go to there. Um, and then uh, foot pain, always there, and uh, inflammation and back pain. And we won't go into this any more than that for now. <laughs> Thanks, Trace. <laughs> Do anyone else want to share uh, chronic conditions? I can go next. Thank you, Melanie. So I would say that in the breakout room, what came up that's always on the forefront of my mind is that I had many chronic conditions for the first half of my life and they resolved many of them and magically new ones came into my life shortly thereafter that have stuck with me since then. Mm -hmm. The new ones that are with me now are spinal and lower back issues, uh, neck issues, both the, the neck and lower back um, are congenital. My, both of my parents have had fusion surgery on their spines, my mother on her neck, my father on his lower back. And I have both of the issues that cause them to have those surgeries myself. But I think in the lower back, it's a lot to do with stability for me. And that leads to issues down my left leg and into my left knee. So it's almost as if it's when it's not getting the attention it needs, it comes out and tries to find new ways to express itself. And things that, the, the other thing that came up in the breakout room is uh, plantar fasciitis, which is something that I never experienced until about 11 years ago, I think it started. 
And it was in one foot and then it was in the other foot and then it was in both feet at the same time and went through um, quite a bit. It went away for a little while and now it's been back for about two years in my left foot only. And um, not sure exactly what's going on with all of that. Um, but the thing that I didn't bring up in the breakout rooms that I think is interesting um, to think about for me is the levels of anxiety and depression have really gotten mostly under control, but there's two things that remain that I think are still forefront that I'm working on a lot. And that's the main one really is the imposter syndrome. And I think anyone um, who here has been through grad school probably has heard of this because it's very common with people who have gone to graduate school. I think I had it long before I went to graduate school though. So, and for those of you who don't know what imposter syndrome is, it's this fear in this most basic sense, it's this fear that everyone's gonna find out that you aren't really worth what you're worth. You're, you're not as smart as you think you are or you say you are. You're not as good at what you do or experienced or skilled at what you do as you think you are and, or as you portray yourself and therefore you're gonna be found out. And then whatever catastrophic bad things come to your mind will happen. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Oh, Siv. Yes, Siv. Um, I want to share my stuff and um, uh, it's about uh, low self-esteem and um, stress and um, trouble with about speaking up <laughs> like now <laughs> and uh, uh, vaginal bleeding for uh, six months every day. Anybody else want to share the conditions they would like us to bear in mind and to reference uh, at appropriate times? Other than the ones that you've posted in the chat uh, and also that uh, Peter and I shared earlier. Uh, and I just would like, first of all, to express gratitude for giving us this frame it's a frame uh, of reference that just helps to provide additional structure for the program and hopefully uh, serve your needs but i also want to invite everyone to take a moment to see how you feel having heard these named listening to the lists, the requests, the identification of these issues. What is the feeling state that arises in you as you hear this? Do you want us to report on that? Sure, briefly. I like, feel pat. I feel this like this worry in my chest. It's like, oh God. I feel like I've sped up all of a sudden. I feel a bit like, oh. That's precisely why I asked this question. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? I ironically actually feel relief. This, this is very interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. I could I have a lot of thoughts about it, but I'm not going to waste the time. And it's not like, thank God, you're all hurting too. That's not where it's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's more like it's just so good to be liberated to just name it so clearly and to be curious about it. That's where that comes from. Why can't we just name the things that are hard for us so freely and say, I'm curious, I care. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Melanie has shared a message. I feel a sense of community and compassion. Hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyone else? 
Yeah, a kind of sense of community, yes. A sense of belonging. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that. Mm. And a feeling, yeah, it's much more relief than um, anxiety. That's gorgeous. I, I want to report uh, what I feel to be some progress on my part because I've been in this situation I think for 40 years or more in which people tell me their sufferings, you know, I mean, as a professional, but likely even before I was a professional where people would tell me their sufferings uh, often uh, in detail, even taxi drivers or, you know, someone sitting next to me on the airplane, um, but also professionally and professionally in enormous detail uh, and enormous suffering. And I could feel the arrival of this sense of responsibility to just start getting to work right away and going through my notes and creating another handbook of some sort. But it was so brief. It was a nanosecond. And I just want to share that because that is actually a cause for celebration for me. And I would say I've been working on this for some time, but it's, it's physiologically actually manifesting. <laughs> so perhaps I invited this sharing to test myself. <laughs> And that doesn't mean I was in any state of detachment about what you share. It doesn't mean that I don't care, quite the opposite. But there was an awareness that we will set out on this journey together. And it's helpful for me as a scientist, it's helpful for me as a healthcare professional uh, to orient, to know what my markers are, where I'm orienting, and to do that without a necessity to fix anything is quite expansive. So I, I do want to thank everyone for that. What we want to do now is uh, explore some assessment tools that are particular to the TAR approach. Uh, and these assessment tools are an example of how I took what I learned from Mary and fused it with neuroscience so that the energy medicine, namely the sites of the body in particular, that she taught about so extensively and so repeatedly, begin to find a Systemic, systematic and systemic shape in terms of assessment. So this comes directly from Mary. However, it also uh, includes my uh, amplification of what I learned from her. So would you share the, the chart? This chart is in your handbook also. Mm -hmm with more explanation about it uh, to supplement what we do here. So deciding the level of treatment that is appropriate to that individual in that moment is exceptionally valuable in terms of efficiency, obviously. But this is an attuned and comprehensive assessment, it's not ticking off boxes, you know, which is the way allopathic uh, professionals tend to make assessments. How much water did you drink today? How much do you weigh? Let's take your height and all of that, all of which is good information. This is a level of assessment that determines in this time frame how can you be the most effective? And Mary was defining these aspects 
in this pyramid based on the depths, which some of you have studied, uh, based on the sites and based on other pulse criteria. Uh, and I'm translating that into something more accessible to everyone who may not have access to pulse listening, such as all of us for the most part now in a pandemic world. So the core level or the basic level, the same level that we're access accessing with our palpation in the core treatment is the source or causative prenatal level. And I will say at this juncture, after considerable reflection, research, investigation, and meditation, that I feel confident that the prenatal or source level is applicable to every one of these situations that have been aired here. However, it may not be the most efficient level of treatment at that moment for that person. But that source causative prenatal level is one portal into chronic conditions that we could explore. And we would need to be able to determine if that is appropriate at that point in time for that person. The postnatal level is the level at which the individual's current life is not functional because of these chronic conditions. So relationships, um, ability to pursue career, ability to complete tasks, uh, ability to function in a healthy age appropriate way is hampered by these uh, interfering chronic conditions. And the symptomatic level is the level at which the pain, discomfort, or symptoms are so overwhelming that if the person doesn't get out of pain, if the person can't have more mobility, if the person can't absorb nutrients, then they're just simply going to either die or give up or some combination of frailty and loss of healthy lifestyle, even livable lifestyle. And there are degrees of that, of course. So if we were translating this only into Jinchantara, only into energy medicine, we would say that that symptomatic level would be a self-care level or a sacred sites level, begin to use the sites directly, immediately, consistently to lessen the symptomatic interference at the postnatal level, if you were only using Jinchantara, which is never my recommendation that you, well, it's not true that it's never my rec recommendation. It, uh, it could be uh, only on its own helpful, particularly at the symptomatic level when you're not gonna process. But even at the symptomatic level, having some awareness of the causative level can be helpful if that's possible for that individual. That's one of the things we have to assess. So the postnatal level, you'd likely be using the meridian flows. You'd likely be using um, the flows in your book one for those of you who have the books and use them, which is not required for this investigation really. So you'd be looking at meridian functions, stabilizing and supporting meridian functions. And of course using Jin Shintara, but the intelligence of that use is more on the ordinary meridian level. There are no ordinary meridians in Jin Shintara, but there are flows in book one that 
uh, approximate the meridian, organ meridian flows. The source or causative prenatal level would involve the depth flows, the advanced flows, the flows in book two, uh, and also very likely a rediscovery, if not more than one rediscovery. And one of the things we do recommend in the treatment of chronic conditions is a five-day intensive. So two treatments a day for five days with the treatments three hours apart. And the protocol for that is all in your handbook that you have on the Mighty Networks uh, channel. And we'll, talk, we'll be talking more about the five-day intensive in this course uh, and the, that formula. The formula for the five-day intensive, two treatments a day for five days with the treatments three hours apart was the formula delivered by Jiru Murai to Mary and Mary delivered to her students, me included. And I was the recipient of five day intensives with Mary multiple times. Um, not because I thought I was addressing a chronic condition. I think I thought my whole life was a chronic condition, but mostly I was doing that to learn from Mary. Um, and so I, I managed somehow to get myself to Scottsdale, Arizona for multiple five-day intensives. But that formula is quite precise and has an energetic rationale behind it. So some people have played with that formula. You can play with it a little bit. Like the treatments could be three and a half or four hours apart. That's better than two hours apart. <laughs> Or I heard of somebody who was doing the five-day intensive and having people come and stay at a retreat center with her, and she would do one treatment a day for 10 days, making the most money possible <laughs> out of the five-day intensive. That's not a five-day intensive. That's something else. That's 10 treatments over a different period of time. So Jiro Mirai had something in mind in terms of energy medicine, and he wouldn't use the word energy medicine, but in terms of the sequence uh, and the response uh, in that particular order. And here we have a picture of Jiro Murai, who is the embodiment of the rite of passage, which a chronic condition is, because of course he had the chronic condition of leukemia that led him to being the one who delivered the Jinshin methodology, the Jinshin wisdom, he reinvigorated a lost science because of his chronic condition. So this is an important component of this course and of the TAR approach is to see every chronic condition, whether it's plantar fasciitis, if it's chronic, I mean, I've had plantar fasciitis once or twice. That's entirely different from having plantar fasciitis for two years or more. So that condition is a rite of passage. It's the transition into another level of consciousness. And that would be true for every one of these chronic conditions, celiac, et cetera. And if it hasn't resolved, it's because it still has more brilliance to offer you. You know, There's more portal opening that needs to occur. And that is a horrible thing to say to somebody who's in enormous amount of pain uh, because of a chronic condition. So you have to be careful when, when or if you choose to say that. So this takes us back to the very important decision of at what level do you enter the treatment for an individual? I'm gonna stop here. This is such exciting material to me. I'm gonna stop here and see if there are any questions. Comments, needs, 
before we go to a brief demo of making the assessment. How are you all feeling about how things are going so far? Thumbs up if you feel like you're getting your needs met. And if you, if you don't feel like you're getting your needs met and you're not showing a thumbs up, please tell me what's missing for you. So I got a thumbs up from Cheryl. I think I saw a thumbs up from Susan. Dres, Siv, good. Liddy. <laughs> Sue, how are you doing? Thumbs up, okay. Peter, two thumbs up, okay. Um, Nalini, I've been working for, I think, five years to say her name properly. Nalini. Yes, apologies, my roommate just got home. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling seen. Hmm. And a resonance, certainly. Um, yeah, that's great. Good. That's a, even better than a thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Gerald, what's happening for you? I want to make sure you get seen also. No, I'm not really feeling like I'm getting my needs met. And in some ways that feels like part of some chronic condition as well as something implicit like I can tell it's a vague not just to do with right now it feels like an echo of something so it's an interesting place where I'm at it doesn't thank feel you. like it's more about right now it's hitting on something else thank you for such a comprehensive answer and is there anything I can do or any thing the group can do at this moment? Uh, no, but just be by saying there's a group is helping me resource because uh, I forgot I, I'm sometimes getting back in the echo where I feel alone, but just the mention of a group hmm. is uh, changing my experience. So that's helpful. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. So I did my um, highly that's science. Stephanie, I just yes, sure. it was such a gorgeous, Gerald, what you just put out so succinctly was actually a gorgeous summary of the different levels you might treat at, like the different ways you could hear what you just said, Gerald. So you're taking it all in, my friend. <laughs> I like seeing that smile. Me too. And Lydia, I miss you, but I know you're there. There's five new messages. Peter, are you tracking all this? I'm gonna let Peter handle the chat for the moment, knowing that he and I are gonna debrief after the class. Yes, Trez, did you wanna say something? No, okay. So I did my uh, highly scientific method of selecting uh, three names for the demo. This will be a very brief demo. It's really just uh, to make an assessment uh, about what level of treatment one might use. And I picked three names in case anyone doesn't wanna be the demo, which is always an option. So the first name is Nalini. I love that you showed us how to say your name. That's very kind. Well, thank you. I appreciate the efforts. Um, sure, happy to. Yeah, so this would just be a conversation really um, where let's say we were meeting to decide how to proceed uh, in terms of you receiving support uh, from the TARA approach. And of the chronic conditions that you named, is there one in particular that you would like to 
zero in on for just this moment? Um, I think uh, let's let's stick with the uh, plantar fasciitis. Yeah, great. So right now, Nalini, in terms of the discomfort or the interference of the plantar fasciitis, what's the level of um, disability you're experiencing from it? At this moment, I'd say if it were on a scale of one to 10 with one being least intense and 10 being most intense, it's around a five or a six. And, and how do you experience that five or six? A uh, very, it, there's, yeah. So the level is that at certain points in the day, it's like someone literally stabbing me with a very big knife in the bottom of my foot. And then the rest of the day, it's more of a dull ache is, is how that's experienced usually. And is it, is that plantar fasciitis like located exactly in the middle of the sole of your foot or where precisely is it? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because many people don't, they assume it's always in the center of the heel and it's not right now. It's on the medial side of, it's on my left foot and it's more towards the medial side of the middle of the heel pad. So it's on your left foot medially towards the middle of your heel pad. So above the actual heel pad, is that correct? No, just, just to the side. To the side of the heel pad. Correct. Could you point to it? <laughs> I can put my foot up. <laughs> Okay, can you see my foot? <laughs> it's my left foot, right? So this is the inside of my foot. This is the outside of my foot. It's actually, I said it wrong, it was on this side. So not, usually the pain is right there where the, the plantar fascia connects to your heel bone right under there. Or a lot of times people have even like the stretching over here um, is the painful part, but I'm having the most pain over right over here. So this is the center of the heel. It's over this way. Yeah, so it's actually moving in a lateral direction. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when you look at the tissue where that plantar fasciitis is, what does the tissue look like? That's the, the impressive part is that upon visual inspection, it looks exactly the same as the other foot. So it's deep. Yes. It's deep. Um, it's, it's at a uh, not at a surface level of the connective tissue. It's myofascial. It's deeply embedded in that area. Yes. And you mentioned that you had the plantar fasciitis before in both feet and that it resolved and now it's come back in the left. When it resolved, what led to the resolution? Do you know? No, I don't. I will say one thing I have noticed is that both when it tends to come back and flare up as well as when it does tend to resolve always seems to be some sort of big transition in my life. And I know it's not anywhere close to 0.7, but somehow there's a connection. Well, it's actually closer to point number six, mm -hmm. quite close to point number six. As most, most plantar fasciitis seems to revolve around point number six. Um, so let's talk about point number six for a minute and just tell me on the level of sensation because I know how smart you are. I know that you are super intelligent and you have a lot of information uh, stored in your awareness and it's valuable and wonderful. Um, but I am not looking for that information right now. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sacred site number six. And what I'd like to hear from you is what you feel in your body uh, when I just describe sacred site number six. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about that myofascial level uh, of tissue. Is that okay with you? Sure. Yeah, and just respond with your sensation, your somatic uh, embodied feeling. If you have any, you may have none. Um, so sacred site number six 
is known, uh, I'm sure everybody here to some extent knows of it as the site of balance. And uh, it's also the place, Nalini, where there actually is a root, you know, this is, this is metaphorical, but also etheric. And I know you know what that means. So that this is both a metaphor and talking about the energetic non-visible realm, that realm of etheric uh, substance that is palpable and visible when you look uh, with your non-visual vision, right? When you're looking beyond the visible, deeper than the visible. So that area is the place where your particular umbilical cord, your particular relationship or connectedness to the earth evolves. So it's like an umbilical cord. That's the root that's referred to uh, that evolves etherically out of sacred site number six. So it's your individuated connection to the body of Gaia. Um, and also another interesting thing about sacred site number six that references some of your other chronic conditions and your intergenerational chronic conditions is that sacred site number six is also known as the chiropractor. So what are you noticing so far? It's odd. Um, this hasn't happened in the last two years since I've been feeling this latest round. It just shifted from one side of my heel to the other side. You mean from it went more medial or more lateral? More, more medial. Okay, so more medial would be more in the direction of sacred site number six. Yes. So staying with that more medial sensation, just put your awareness there and just let me know what that brings up for you. That same instability that sensation of not having something to hold on to. Thank you. Thank you for being so tuned in. And also thank you for finding the language that matches how tuned in you are. It's gorgeous. I would definitely treat at the causative level here. So she has discomfort, but what is greater than the discomfort is the awareness that there's a larger story here. And you don't always encounter that. You don't always encounter an individual who has the capacity to hold discomfort in this larger context. And that would be an individual ready for the causative level. And I want, to say with great commitment here, the causative level doesn't mean you're a better person than the symptomatic level. All the levels have equal value. It's just a matter of assessing. So we have about 20 minutes left uh, in our class today. Is that correct, Peter? It's pretty close. Um, I am wondering if you feel that going into a breakout room now and just listening to one person uh, and positing a particular a possible assessment level would be a good use of this time. Uh, and then reversing that experience tomorrow. I'm aware suddenly that Trez, are you still not gonna be with us tomorrow?
Sadly, I'm afraid I'm not. Okay. Very sadly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm only here just to name, I'm only here until about one tomorrow. Okay. That so that, okay. Yeah. Um, that was the plan was to let you have an experience of assessment. Uh, do you want to just save all that for tomorrow? And sadly, Trez will miss it. Um, or another possibility is that we could venture into that now and perhaps someone would like to try doing what I did with Nalini, with Trez, uh, with the healing circle around so that Trez can have the opportunity to uh, experience this. And I'm also open to other ideas for the best use of our time. And just to say that the plan for tomorrow would be to, uh, Liddy liked that idea. Uh, the plan for tomorrow will be that we will actually do a, a full demonstration from assessment to treatment, um, as well as adding additional uh, information such as the two new flows actually experiencing them tomorrow. Gerald is in agreement with my idea. Okay, how, how about Therese? Therese is good with this. So Therese, who would you like yeah. to work with here? And any, any person in the room, uh, no one is gonna feel hurt if you don't pick them. Who do you feel magnetized? Well, well what, I, what, what I might, what I might suggest to Susan, seeing as we were in the breakout room together, if she's all right with that. Uh, I can't see Susan now, let me see. She's, she's saying yes. Okay. Oh, there you are, hello. Okay. <laughs> Good, and what you might wanna do is you might wanna pin Susan and Trez. And so why don't you take about 10 minutes, Susan and Trez, and all that, needs to occur here all. It's lovely, wonderful, uh, comprehensive and touching uh, is an assessment of the level of treatment appropriate for Trez with Trez selecting the issue she wants to address. Okay. And so Susan, you would be the practitioner here. So have you decided, Therese? Uh, well, yes. Oh. oh dear. <laughs> This could be an ongoing issue. Yeah, those <laughs> things are, they're really tricky. Yeah. They're great, but they're a bit of a nuisance. But anyway, uh, yes, Susan, I go with um, pain between the shoulder blades just now. Mm. If that's okay. And could you describe it in more detail for us, please? Mm. So it's like it's emanating from the center, from the spine. And it's like there's an elastic band pulling across from the spine up to either, either side. So it's tight. Yeah, and stretched. And if you if you go to that place now, is there anything more that you can add to that? No, there's heat rising now, as I, as I name it. I would say there's heat rising in the 
front part of my body that corresponds to that, you know, back area. It's like the front has become very warm. Um, And there's a sense that the, the elastic has become more bubbly than, than, than taut, if you like. So the, the elastic has become more light. But there's still that um, pain in the center. And that elastic bubbly feeling you describe, is that new? Mm. Um, new when I spoke about the heat, but that's now subsiding. So the bubbly is just, is subsiding. And new in, in terms of, if you've been aware of this before, had you noticed that? Or is it a new noticing no. in this moment? No, it's a new noticing in this moment. And do you feel it because we are looking at that place? And as we're looking, there's a response in the place that we're looking at to the looking. No, I'd say if it's anything, it's more a response to the naming of the heat, I think, than the looking, because it's kind of gone back now to the, the familiar. So there's something about the heat that evoked the bubbles. Okay. And the heat has subsided. So I don't know. But I know we're still looking. <laughs> and did the bubbles represent anything to you? Lightness. Um, play. Childlike taking off. Freedom. Rising. Willow trees. one more minute Susan so that 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 change you were just describing was there in your face mm. so you'd gone into something there mm. Mm. do you mean just now it was in my face or at the time it was in my face yeah as you as as you were as you were voicing that, so this was showing on your face. Um, just just now. As we're yeah, just now. There was a okay. smile there, but it was yeah. more than a smile. It was a, yeah. a softening. Um, 
I would say we treat the root. That would be my estimation. I think we'd go to the root for trays. Thank you. Thank you. The one thing I might Thanks. add, I, I think that would be that would work uh, with Trez for sure. And based on what she exhibited, I think that would be a really good choice. The one thing that did occur to me was the focus on the heat. So when Trez was talking about the heat, what occurred to me was that this might bear a relationship to circulation. Uh, so the possibility is there that it could be two levels simultaneously, which is entirely possible, uh, which would be the causative level, but also the uh, symptomatic level. So increasing, it's possible that increasing circulation to the area, because she said the center circle of pain in the middle between the shoulder blades, which by the way, uh, we are gonna talk about extensively tomorrow. Um, and Trez, you'll get it on the recording, of course. But we're gonna talk about this very area that Trez is discussing here the back door to the heart as being critical. There's two areas that I'm suggesting are critical in the treatment of all chronic conditions. And those are the two flows that I've included in the handbook. And those two areas are, they're really the front and back of each other, the midline and the back door to the heart. That in every chronic condition, if you treat the midline or you strengthen the midline, you strengthen alignment and you open the back door to the heart, which is that area between the shoulder blades, the 910 area, Peter's going to show us exactly what it is. You're going to make a difference with all chronic conditions. So Trez is actually bringing forward one of our major topics for tomorrow, the back door to the heart. And we have a special flow to release it. And so the sense I had because of the focus on the heat, the difference the heat made. So heat implies circulation, implies more red blood cells, implies more energy directed which was the way that she was noticing <clears throat> the change. So that suggests to me that on the symptomatic level, she needs some structural support, maybe muscular, that would come from opening the back door to the heart in particular. It doesn't negate what you said, Susan. It's just you know, another component because we do make decisions often when we are working with people in person, which we can do uh, in Aotearoa and also in the US. If people wanna come to my studio, it's possible now if you've been vaccinated. Um, we make a decision when we're treating at that causative level, if we're just gonna do a rediscovery or we're gonna integrate a rediscovery and hands-on treatment and I would recommend the integration. Uh, in this case, I would certainly like to try that. And just to say, um, Stephanie, when I, I had a quick glance at the chronic conditions and I looked at the back door to the heart and I thought, that's the one. That's the one, yeah. yeah. That's the one I have, to, I have to work with. Yeah. And there's in the handbook, there's a self-care flow for the back door mm -hmm. to the heart. It's, it's a new one that I created from okay, the practitioner yeah. flow that hasn't been published before from Mary. Yeah. yeah. But it has right. to be, I think, yeah. I think Susan is spot on. It has to be in conjunction with that causative level. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Awesome, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Beautiful question, Susan. 
you're ready for the practical, Susan. <laughs> she says no. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Peter, put on your wizard hat and give us a beautiful closure for today. Oy, and I... Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remind people to, if you have not already joined the Mighty Networks platform, please do so you can get all these juicy things. Thank you. For those listening as well, please. Okay, let's do another one of these stretches that Gerald is modeling for us. Oh, it's, it's like a show tune. I went to a show tune last night to see Wicked. They were doing lots of this kind of fantastic big movements um moving i get a sense that moving will help me to let what happened today land a little bit to help my body move through it and make sense of it oh yeah i'll just mute stephanie's microphone there so um let's hold these 20s and fours uh to to finish this final thought so 20s across the forehead and fours in the back of the head and um just hold them for a bit and not say anything and then when we're done i'll ask you for uh, one word to describe your time today in this course So oh, let's uh, hear a word from everybody. If there was one word that would describe your experience today in the course, what would it be? Hmm. Yay, we get to see Lydia again. Mine would be, <laughs> mine would be enthusiastic. Thank you, Susan. Mine would be stimulated. I would say which is I would say which rich. Mine was hyphenated. I'm ever more curious. <laughs> <laughs> Liddy. You said. Can you say that again? Maybe put it in the chat, Liddy. Yeah, your internet's challenging today, isn't it? Um, yeah, check it out in the chat. We'll say it for you. Nalini? Reignition. Reignition. And Sip. Um, uh, chaos. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's a lot I don't understand. I have to, yes, I think it's a little bit difficult. Because of the English? Yes. So, Siv, I know that when you send me questions, they're very clear, because I know you have the time to think about that, maybe look for the words. Mm. Send me your questions. You can send them by the way you normally send the questions, you know, by text. You can send me the questions. Yeah, fine. 
Thank and you. then I will see if I can help sort things out. Fine, thank you. <laughs> uh, Liddy said juicy edge. Juicy edge. Gerald, do you have a word? Deliberation. Deliberation. Uh -huh. uh, Stephanie, what's your word? I feel really excited and uh, eager uh, and ready for more. Yeah. How about you? My, word, my word is stretchy. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a way to wind up today. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to Stephanie and um, she might have any more words in closure, but otherwise we will see you in the morning. Yeah, so uh, just uh, Palm in Jew. This is miraculous and organizing. And please do allow this very simple in you, this simple gesture to be everything that you need because it truly is the primary river of splendor that awakens intelligence beyond anything you even knew was possible for you. And that's what these chronic conditions call forth from us. Why they're a rite of passage for the practitioner as well as the person experiencing the condition. Allow that. No one would present, you would not have this challenge were it not for your capacity to access this amazing brilliance, which is your birthright. Trust that. I'm speaking to myself as well as to you. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Feel free to send questions here through my email, text, or Mighty Networks. Love to all of you. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. On the way. Gratitude to Kai. Oh my God, I'm so happy I saw Kai. Yeah.